Time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Years of Liberal scandal, waste and mismanagement have seen this government attack frontline workers across the province. Health care, home care, hospitals and, over the last few years, now schools. The Liberals are fast-tracking school closures and there is currently potentially 600 Order. schools on the chopping block. Wow. Students from my riding in Simcoe North who currently go to schools in Honey Harbour are at risk. Both schools, Catholic and public in Honey Harbour, are slated to close. That means some students will be sent over an hour away on a bus to Midland. This is after the Liberals already closed schools in Wabashine and Port McNichol. Mr. Speaker, this government is attacking rural schools and sending children on hour-long bus rides. What happened to Question. the community hub the Liberals promised? Mr. Speaker, when will, when will the Premier and when will this Liberal government stop their Thank attack you. on rural schools? Thank you. Order. It does sound to me I'm going to keep a very close uh, watch and hear what's going on. If it sounds to me like we're going to move down a road like we did last week, I will be the first to come up and say we're going to go to warnings. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to uh, take the question, but before I do, I want to congratulate both newly elected MPPs, Sam Osterhoff for Niagara West Granbrook and Natalie Rose for Ottawa Vanier, and we look forward to welcoming them both to Queen's Park, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, uh, I know that decisions around uh, school closures, school consolidations are some of the most difficult that school boards have to make, Mr. Speaker, um, and they require uh, consultation with the community, including parents. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, quite contrary to what the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition and his colleagues are saying, we've actually worked to change the funding formula so that that process would be more rational and so that it would actually be slowed down, Mr. Speaker. In 2015-16, will provide uh, approximately $3.7 billion in funding towards Answer. rural schools, and since 2002, the per-pupil funding has increased by 64 per cent, Mr. Speaker, across Thank the you. province. Supplementary. The member from Perry Sound, Ms. Volker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Premier. <laughs> Speaker, if both Honey Harbour Public School and Our Lady of Mercy Catholic School close, it will be a huge blow to the, the entire Honey Harbour community. As a past trustee who wrote me today stated, quote, closing both schools in Honey Harbour will not only destroy the social fabric of the Honey Harbour community, but also the economic engine and well-being of the service providers, close quote. This afternoon, I will table petitions containing over 1,000 signatures asking for your government's help to find a solution that will best serve children and families of the area. This includes the potential for co-location at a single school site. Speaker, will the Premier commit to finding a solution that will help keep a primary school, school open in the town of Honey Harbour? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say, um, and, I, and I, want to, I want to speak specifically to the issues around co-location and cooperation, because that is a very important aspect of this. There have been situations in this province, Mr. Speaker, since uh, before the time that I was Minister of Education uh, and beyond, where there have been solutions if boards worked together and found a way to uh, co-locate schools then there could have been a school remain open in a community. Sometimes that's hard to do, and I would encourage all MPPs in this, in this House to work with, their, with their, uh, all the co-located school boards and the municipalities, Mr. Speaker, because the reality is, for the first time in Ontario's history, we do have a community hub project working across government, Mr. Speaker. That's the first time that there has been an explicit recognition that community hubs are important. But it means that Everyone Answer. in the community needs to work together, and MPPs can really be a very important part of that, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Our vast north covers two-thirds of all of Ontario. There are rural schools spread far and wide. A school with 50 or 80 students is the norm. 
But when you put these schools under a review, they can never match up with the Made in South rules and regulations. Our northern schools are small because of the very nature of where they're located. Many towns of four or 5,000 have 100 kilometres between them and the nearest community. These schools will simply not fit into the government's mould. I urge the Premier to follow the steps of our leader, Patrick Brown, here, here. who has come to the North and seen what Northern communities Order. look like. Will the Premier give Northern schools the Question. unique attention they deserve? No, Mr. Speaker, when I was the Minister of Education, I visited a school in Sioux Narrows. I think there were 16 students there, Mr. Speaker. I made the argument that we keep that school open. Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to take lessons from the party opposite on schools, Mr. Speaker. Since 2012-2013, we've increased the annual funding for, uh, for rural boards by 109. All members. $199 million, which is 5.7 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's in the face of declining enrollment. So we're going to continue to work with boards. We understand that there are reviews happening across the province, Mr. Speaker, and we look to the boards and the local communities to work together to find those solutions, Mr. Speaker. But we also have to recognize that students need to have the best learning environments possible where they can get Answer. the programs that they need in every corner of the province, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Leeds, well, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the, uh, to the Premier. Speaker, I've written the Minister of Education calling for a moratorium on school closures while we find long-term answers to ensure rural Chief students government whip. can continue to learn close to home. I was shocked that she told me those solutions won't be found at Queen's Park. It's unacceptable for your minister to sit on the sidelines and leave the future of rural education to a process rigged against these communities. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Michelle Taylor Russell. resigned from the Accommodation Review Committee in my riding because she called it highly flawed and undemocratic. Rigged. None of it inspires confidence, she said. Michelle and others have exposed this process as a smoke and mirrors farce. Speaker, will the Premier put an end to these charades by implementing a moratorium on school closures before it's too late? Question. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the party opposite does not have a history of believing in or supporting school boards. I actually believe in school boards. I think that school boards play an important role. So, you know, we know, Mr. Speaker, that there are examples of school consolidations where there have been two small schools. The member from Leeds Granville come to order. In two small schools that have been consolidated, Mr. Speaker, and a new school has been built, and I believe that uh, Garfield Dunlop at one point was singing the praises of just such a consolidation. Mr. Speaker, those are the kinds of decisions that local school boards need to make. We have continued to increase funding in the face of declining enrollment, but Mr. Speaker, school boards have to be respected to go through a process with communities to make the best decisions for kids in their communities. Thank you. Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, come to order. Member from Beaches East York, come to order. New question. Member from Lanark Front, Member Lennox. Speaker, again to the Premier. It's time for the Premier to take ownership of yet another of her mistakes. Up to 40 schools are slated to close in my riding alone. School closures are not the cause, but a symptom of communities in decline. And that is the true Liberal legacy, the decline of small town and rural Ontario. Speaker, the Premier's policies, the Premier's economic actions, the Premier's restrictive land use regulations and skyrocketing hydro rates have suffocated growth and prosperity in rural Ontario. Now in my riding alone, up to 40 community schools wow. are on the chopping block. Speaker, when will this Liberal government release that fatal grip that they have and allow rural Ontario to breathe, prosper and grow again. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Education. 
Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we know that schools play a very important role in the social fabric of our communities. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, that is why, when it comes to rural school boards, our government has clearly shown that it understands the needs in rural communities. In 2015-16, we provided approximately $3.7 billion in funding towards rural schools. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that is reflected in our grants for students' needs to ensure that rural communities have that additional support that they need. Since 2002, we've increased per pupil funding by $4,753, 64%. And Mr. Speaker, I've talked to the, um, the chair of the Upper Canada School Board and Mr. Speaker, they understand Answer. that the status quo is not an option, that they have to look at their schools from a local perspective and what the needs are today and Thank for you. the future. And that's exactly what they're doing. Thank you. Final, final supplementary member, Stormont Dundas, and self -clean. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. The closure of many schools across rural Ontario due to this ministry's ill-conceived funding policies will rip the heart out of many rural communities. If the review, current review continues under the flawed guidelines set in 2015, 20 schools in SCNG, students will have less time to spend with their families, fewer opportunities to participate in extracurricular activities close to home, less sleep and more stress due to overcrowding in the few schools that remain. How hard is it to see that this is a bad deal for students? The ministry strives for higher results, but these schools are already exceeding provincial standards. Will the Premier listen to the people of rural Ontario, impose a moratorium on the flawed pupil accommodation reviews, sit down with school boards, municipalities and residents to hammer out a sustainable rural education strategy that preserves our community's access to high Question. quality primary and secondary ex education close to home? Mr. Speaker, we're doing just that. We are listening to the needs of local communities through the elected school board trustees, Mr. Speaker. That's why there is an accommodation review process that is underway to allow an opportunity for the school boards to consult with municipalities, with parents, with students in terms of how to make this decision. We understand, Mr. Speaker, that it is a difficult decision that school boards have to make. But, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't mean that they don't need to make the decision. What's important is that this is an opportunity for people to provide good input so that they can make the best decision possible. And, Mr. Speaker, we're supporting the changes and the transformations that needs to occur. We have a, we have a school consolidation fund that allows schools to combine so that they can actually deliver better and more structured programs Answer. for students so that students' um, achievement and well-being is considered as well. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On Friday, Mayor John Henry of Oshawa spoke out on the alarming high increase in his uh, city's hydro bills over the past year. Mayor Henry said that Oshawa paid just over $151,000 in one month to light the city's streets in 2015, and in 2016, the same month, cost more than $221,000. That's an increase of $70,000 in one year. Now, I know the Premier told Liberal Party members this weekend that high electricity prices were her mistake. Does the Premier finally understand, Speaker, that her wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One is a mistake and is hurting families, businesses and municipalities like Oshawa, and will she put an end to it now? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, uh, I thank the uh, leader of the third party for the question, and uh, I believe that the uh, that the leader is talking uh, specifically about municipal costs, uh, the mayor's uh, the mayor's costs. And, Mr. Speaker, I, as I said, uh, as I have said many times in this house, and I said on the weekend, we recognize that there is uh, an issue, that there is a burden that has been uh, put on uh, on people across the province in terms of electricity costs, Mr. Speaker. We're working to take those costs out of the system and off people's bills. But, Mr. Speaker, um, I, just, I just need to say, in the case of uh, municipalities uh, in specific, we have we have, since we've been in office, been taking costs that were previously downloaded onto the municipal uh, tax base, Mr. Speaker. We've been taking those costs off that tax base to the tune of over $2.5 billion, Mr. Speaker, which pro provides relief for municipalities across the province. Thank you. Well, Speaker, it's one thing to admit you've made a mistake, and it's quite an another to actually 
fix that mistake. Here, here. Yeah. Families who have to choose between paying huge hydro bills or putting food on the table, businesses that have to lay off staff just to keep the lights on, or municipalities that have seen their hydro costs nearly double in a year, they are not interested, Speaker, in empty platitudes from this Premier. They want action. Will the Premier finally right the wrong of her Hydro One sell-off and show the people of Ontario that she can put the people of Ontario ahead of her well-connected friends? Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I, uh, as I again, as I have said, um, we recognize that there are uh, there are challenges. There's a burden that uh, that people are confronting, which is why we have been making changes. We've taken the debt retirement charge off bills, Mr. Speaker. We uh, created the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker. We've put off new generating projects, which which take costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker. And beginning January 1st, we're taking the provincial portion of the HST 8% off people's bills, Mr. Speaker. In addition to that, to go back to the municipal example, Barry, for example is saving $2 million a year by switching to LED lighting. So, Mr. Speaker, there, is a variety of, there are a variety of things that we are doing, Mr. Speaker, but I have said that we need to do more, and I am committed to doing more, Mr. Answer, Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, Mayor Henry said that high hydro bills are costing his community jobs. He said that a year ago, GM moved production of the Cam Camaro from Oshawa to Michigan, where he said they get cheaper Ontario power in Michigan. Speaker, Whether or not the Premier can admit it, her wrong-headed sell-off is hurting Oshawa. Minister economy. of Economic Development, come to order. Business, hampering business from starting up or expanding, or sometimes just keeping afloat. That affects everyone who lives there, Speaker, and the same thing is happening in communities across the province. If high hydro prices are the Premier's mistake, when will she begin to fix the problem and stop any further sell-off of hydro water? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to stand and rise and answer this question, Mr. Speaker, because municipalities are the ones that are seeing many of the benefits of the broadening of the sale of Hydro One. For example, in my riding of Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, where they're seeing the expansion of Maley Drive. I know the Minister of Transportation has been making announcements in Hamilton and throughout the province on investments, Mr. Speaker, that we're making in municipalities that are benefiting those communities and creating jobs. And when it comes to businesses, Mr. Speaker, the ICI program, for example, just last year, we had 80 new participants, six auto part manufacturers in Guelph, two food processing plants in Brampton, 10 assorted manufacturing plants in, uh, in the York region, a textile plant in Woodstock, a printing plant in Owen Sound, a building products manufacturer in Burlington, Mr. Speaker. I don't have enough time to talk about all of the new businesses that have signed up to the ICI program, and with the changes that we made, Mr. Speaker, over 1,000 new businesses will be able to sign up. That is great news Thank for the you. province, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Today in the gallery, there are parents from small towns and rural areas who are asking the Premier to save their children's schools. Schools in Lively, in Owen Sound, in the village of Long Sioux are on the chopping block. Nearly 40 schools throughout rural Ontario are slated for closure. Rural students already have less access to music and health programs compared to students in larger centres. Now this government is going to make it even harder for these students to participate in extracurriculars, forcing them to attend schools outside their hometown and spend hours on a bus commuting each day. When will the Premier recognize the importance of rural schools and actually provide these schools the resources they need to stay open? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome all of the families who are here who are concerned about their uh, local schools. I completely understand that, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly why, since we have been in office, we have increased funding to rural schools, Mr. Speaker, even though there has been a reduction in enrollment, because we recognize how important those schools are. But to the leader of the third party, it is the very reason that there needs to be a review of schools that sometimes there's an inability for school boards to deliver the exact programs that the leader of the third party was talking about. Those music programs, those art programs. Mr. Speaker, there needs to be a review to make sure that 
where there are some very small schools, where there can be consolidations, where kids are not getting the very best learning environment, that the boards work to make sure Answer. that that's the case. We're working with the boards. The Minister of Education is talking with the, uh, with the boards, but the boards know their communities Thank best, you. and they need to make those decisions, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Supplementary. The boards need the help of the provincial government to be able to provide the services and the education that every child deserves in this province, Speaker. That's what the boards need. Schools are more than just bricks and mortar. They're actually parks and playgrounds, often the historical and cultural hub of a community. But last year, this government rewrote the book on school closures uh, to silence community input and fast-track the process. They even included a loophole speaker that allows a school to be closed within two months with no meaningful public input. When will this Premier stop forcing this closure of rural and community schools and immediately rewrite the guidelines to give communities a voice in the process? Thank you. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not sure where the uh, leader of the third party is getting her information from, but right now the school boards are actually going through uh, a consultation process, an accommodation review process. They're actually talking to their local communities because, Mr. Speaker, the status quo is not sustainable. They know that some decisions do need to be made. These are difficult decisions, and it's important that a conversation occur between the school boards and the local community. And, Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what is happening. But I want to speak to the question of support for our local schools in, in rural areas. Because, Mr. Speaker, we have, since 2012-2013, we've increased the annual G Grants for Student Needs funding for rural boards by over $199 million a 5.79% increase and these increases take Answer. into consideration Mr. Speaker the unique needs that are in rural communities to ensure that we can provide the good quality programs that Thank every you. child deserves Mr. Speaker final supplementary Speaker, for all the claims that the Premier and her minister make about investing in education, parents, students and educational workers just aren't buying it. Today, rural Ontario parents are at the doorstep of Queen's Park to say enough is enough. The Geographic Circumstance Grant has been cut by $10 million in the past two years. This is money used to keep our rural schools open. Speaker. New Democrats know that where a child lives should not determine the quality quality of education or supports that they receive. We know communities, students, parents should all have a say in the future of their schools. Will the Premier actually listen? In fact, when will this Premier actually listen to parents and education workers who are rallying to save their schools today and take action to keep small and rural Question. schools open? Thank you. Minister? You see it, please? You say it, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know we are listening to uh, the concerns raised by parents. I just met with a group of uh, parents and members of the community this morning, and uh, I will join the Premier in welcoming parents who are here, because it's important, Mr. Speaker, that locally elected school board trustees have the responsibility of deciding where and how they provide education services to students of the board, including making the tough decisions around school closures or consolidations. Mr. Speaker, we are assisting in that by providing the necessary funding and supports to allow that process to occur. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to say that it would be financially irresponsible if nothing was done, Mr. Speaker. It is our responsibility to deliver effective programs to all students, and we must have these difficult conversations. And I, I want you to know, Mr. Speaker, that conversations are occurring. They're occurring with local municipalities, with parents, with students, and the boards will have that decision Thank that you. they need to make. No question. The member from Bruce Carroll South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Schools are a community's cultural asset. They drive local economies. Closing them removes recreational space. It eliminates opportunities for all, from businesses and working parents to vulnerable populations. The community impact is huge. It also creates complex fiscal and social problems, problems that future generations will have to somehow fix. Sadly, this is the gritty reality this government hid 
from public debate when they rewrote the accommodation review guidelines. The Premier surely understands she needs to open her eyes to solutions. I want to know, will she avoid another mistake? Will she stand with the people and be part of a solution by imposing a moratorium and fixing these arbitrary guidelines and reinstate the community impact component? Here, here. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, before I enter politics, I focus my time on building communities. And I understand that in order for that to occur, you have to have conversations, you have to have collaboration, and you have to have people working together. And Mr. Speaker, the through the, the accommodation review process, the school boards have a defined guideline in which to do that, and that is exactly what they are doing. Mr. Speaker, I want to quote um, a, a trustee from the Blue Water District School Board who talks about accommodation reviews are happening right across the province for exactly the same reason that they are happening in our area. Fewer students, too many schools, change is never easy. The challenge is to make sure that the buildings that are closed are the right ones Order. and that the decisions made are in the best interest of students under our care. Yes, Mr. Speaker, clearly the trustees of these local boards understand decisions are not made at Queen's Park about yep. school consolidations. They're made at the local level. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Premier's lack of passion for action, especially as a former trustee and Minister of Education, is appalling. School closing is a problem in need of a solution. It's short-sighted because, Member frankly, Beaches, short we in rural Ontario need schools to survive. Everyone needs schools to survive. Concerned parents, community leaders, business owners, they are all at Queen's Park because they want the Premier to work on a solution. It's the Premier's time to decide. Will she avoid another mistake like the hydro fiasco and stand with the people before it's too late? Or will she shrug as communities brace for potentially 600 school closures? Mr. Speaker. I understand that these are very tough decisions for um, local boards to make, Mr. Speaker, and that's why the decision to close a school when it's under capacity is far from an easy one, and a decision that must be made by trustees at the local level for the future of their community. Member from Beaches East York is warned. Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, second time. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, kids deserve to attend the best schools possible in our province. And parents and students and the community at large deserve to be heard during this accommodation review process. And that is exactly what is happening. These decisions are not happening here at Queen's Park. They are happening Answer. through the conversation that local trustees are having with their local communities in the best interest of their students, Mr. Here, here. Speaker. New question. Member from Park Day Hot Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, the TTC is meeting to discuss another round of fare increases and service cuts that will, in fact, hurt transit riders. It's hard to see how the TTC can maintain ridership when transit keeps getting more expensive and service keeps getting more uncomfortable, less reliable, and less convenient. The TTC used to be the envy of North America back when the provincial government provided 50 per cent funding for TTC operations. The Tories cut the funding and it stayed cut under the Liberals. What will the Premier do to ensure that the TTC remains, in fact, the better way? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Park Del High Park for her question this morning. Uh, Speaker, that member would know, every member uh, in the legislature would know that our government, uh, not only in the last couple of years, uh, Speaker, but over the last number of years, has made a significant, uh, significant investment to transit in the City of Toronto and right across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, Speaker. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. For example, since 2004, uh, the provincial government has provided almost $2 billion, one point, almost $1.8 billion in gas tax funding specifically wow. to the City of Toronto. And in this current year, Speaker, that number is at around $170 million. Wow. There is a long list of projects that we provide support to, Speaker, that are so crucial to making sure that the people of Toronto and the people of the entire region have the transit network Answer. Uh, that they so richly deserve, Speaker. And I'm sure in the follow-up question, I'll have the opportunity to go through some of those crucial projects. Thanks very much. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. The Premier, when she was Transportation Minister, 
forced the TTC to accept Presto, which has been unreliable and extremely expensive. Yeah. She just downloaded transit costs onto Toronto that her government had originally agreed to pay. She has ripped up long-standing transit plans, bringing more chaos and waste, and TTC riders are paying the price. Since she became Premier, the cost of a Metro Pass has risen twice as fast as inflation, while service is worse. Instead of downloading more costs to, onto TTC riders, what will the Premier do to make transit affordable and convenient for Toronto riders? Thanks very much, Speaker. I, I, think, I think the most important thing for that member and all members in the House to do, Speaker, is to take a look at the whole picture. Uh, over the last two years and currently, Speaker, here is, a, here, is a, uh, here is a list of the projects that are being supported by our Premier and by the Ontario government. So, for example, Speaker, $3.7 billion for GO Regional Express Rail, wow. specifically in the 416, Speaker. $450 million to deliver the Union Pearson Express on time and on budget. $416 million from the province to support the purchase of 200 new streetcars. Wow. Approximately $8 billion for the Toronto LRT plan, Speaker, including the Crosstown and the Finch. I mentioned the $1.75 billion in gas tax funding, $172 million for the revitalization of Union Station, $150 million to Metrolinx to support the planning of the regional relief line, Speaker, and the list goes on from there. Our Premier and our government will continue to invest Thank in you. transit in Toronto and right across this region. Thank you. Your question, member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. The Minister was in Marrakesh recently with counterparts from around the globe at the 2016 United Nations Climate Conference. Ontario's participation at the annual conference demonstrates our commitment to tackling the consequences of climate change. Working alongside neighbouring jurisdictions, our government has engaged in both the dialogue and actions needed to protect our environment. But, Speaker, with the recent results of the U.S. presidential election, there are concerns on how this may influence the discourse on climate change. We've relied on partnerships to take on the battle against climate change. It's allowed us to become innovators in the green economy. Speaker, could the minister please inform the House on the steps that our government is taking to continue building on partnerships that will help benefit Ontario's Mr. environment and the economy? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member both for her advocacy on climate change and her understanding of the opportunities of a low-carbon economy, uh, and, and for the question. This was a very important conference because it was really the first conference to start working on implementing the Paris Agreement, and for Ontario. Uh, the next few months is important. We launch our first auction in March. At the same time when we launch this in March, China launches its carbon market, meaning that 60 per cent of the world's economy will be, will be covered by cap-and-trade carbon markets. We worked very hard with California, with Germany, the United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea on setting the rules for trading carbon allowances and reductions, uh, for, for looking at the relationships between uh, carbon, the carbon economy and trade, and these things called ITMOs, internationally traded transferable yes, mitigation outcomes, which are the mechanisms by which Ontario will buy and sell GHG reductions. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister, and I'd like to thank him for his advocacy and leadership on this file. Uh, a linked carbon economy is certainly going to help leverage Ontario's working relationship with other jurisdictions. It also acknowledges the shared responsibility that we all have in the battle against climate change. Our commitment to this battle was underscored when our government phased out coal-fired plants, standing by our promise to power this province through clean energy sources. More recently, Recently, Ontario's commitment was illustrated when our members moved forward to recognize the objectives that were laid out in the 2015 Paris Agreement. We hope that our efforts are going to be mirrored by our partners across North America and abroad. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the House what these transformative measures will mean for the people of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, thanks to the member for the question. Uh, one, as you can imagine, one of the hot topics in Morocco was the United States, given the, uh, the election. 
And it was fascinating for many of us how motivated everyone else in the world was to get on with implementing Paris. And what was particularly interesting, and the member from Simcoe North would know this because he had a front seat for this, in Canada we had 10 years where the federal government would not allow the words climate change to even be used at federal provincial tables, Shame. subsidized fossil fuels, and opposed any carbon pricing mechanism. Wow. And at the same time, provinces, Nova Scotia, Ontario, New, Bruns uh, New Brunswick, British Columbia, and Quebec closed coal plants introduced cap and trade in North America with California yes, and saw some of the largest reductions in the world. Our partnerships with the U.S. states suggest that's about to happen in the United States through the same process. Thank you. Any question? The member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The 2009 Green Energy Act stripped away local autonomy from communities across Ontario, sure and we all know how that has negatively impacted Ontarians as well as their hydro bills. Now, Speaker, the Premier is continuing to thumb her nose at communities by just this spring ripping the community impact of school closures out of the ARC review process. Wow. And as a result, Speaker, this Premier is choosing to make another mistake by ignoring the negative community impacts that will occur when she rips the heart of, out of communities like in Paisley and Chesley by closing their schools. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to a moratorium on school closures and to fixing these arbitrary guidelines? Thank you, Education. Of Education. Thank you Speaker. Speaker <laughs> I think that it's important to recognize that the pupil accommodation review guidelines is really giving our school boards, our local school boards, a tool so that they can engage in conversation with the local um, community when a tough decision like closing or consolidating a school has to be made. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I went through this process in my own community, and yes, the conversations were difficult. But what happened at the end of the day is that our students were able to actually move to other locations that had better programming because we were able to provide, take those investments and those Remember savings and provide a, a more diverse um, set of options for students in terms of their programming. So this is all about ensuring that yes, we make the right sets of investments so that our students can get the best learning outcomes possible, Mr. Speaker. And in order to do that, a decision has to be made locally. Supplementary, the member from Holland and Norfolk. Yes, uh, speaker, back to the Premier. Strong rural communities need strong schools to remain destinations for business and families. Closing rural schools can have a dramatic impact on rural areas where schools are often the heart of the community. And the economic impact of closing a school in a rural area should always be considered. Yet the Ministry of Education, as we understand, has quietly removed the last two criteria of the PARGE process that looks at value to community, value to the local economy. People in Ontario have lost their democratic right to have a say in the decisions that affect not only the education of their children, but the survival of the schools and the health of their communities. Premier, there are alternatives to closing schools. Will the Premier explain to this House Chief why she turned her time. back on our Question. rural economies and our rural communities. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to give a, an example. Funding for, for school boards in the eastern region has increased by $1.4 billion since 2003. Mr. Speaker, that's an 80 per cent increase. And Mr. Speaker, Taking lessons from a party where in 2014 the plan for education was to cut 2,000 teaching positions and 5,000 early childhood educator jobs and, that, and support and 10,000 support staff. Mr. Speaker, the PCs campaigned on a plan to fire teachers. And I quote, will it mean fewer teachers? It does. It will mean fewer teachers in our stu in our system. And this was from the leader Order. of that party, Mr. Speaker. The PC's Shameful. cuts to education meant Answer. that at least 22,000 jobs would be lost in education, and that's not good Thank for you. students, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Workers at the Peel Children's Aid Society have been on strike for nine weeks as they try to get the employer to understand that workload caps are necessary so that vulnerable children get the care they need. The employer has been filling the gap with inadequate replacement staff. I have raised these concerns with both the Minister of Children and Youth Services and the Minister of Labour, but the Peel CAS refuses to reach an agreement with workers. How long does the Premier plan on letting this continue? Thank you, Mr. Children and Youth Services. Mr. Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. I know that um, uh, she's a strong advocate for her community and also for children here in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as labour negotiations are a matter between the employer and the employee, uh, the member notes that it would be completely inappropriate for me to comment on the specifics of that uh, process. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, we want to make sure, and as the minister responsible for children and youth here in the province of Ontario, we want to make sure that there's a plan in place that will ensure that young people um, in care are being protected and, uh, and that they're, uh, they're uh, provided with the opportunities uh, they need uh, to make sure that they're safe. Uh, while this process goes on. Uh, we're hopeful that the union and the employer will do all they can do to reach uh, a conclusion that would be favourable for uh, children in care, and I know that the Minister of Labour and the Supplemental will, uh, will want Answer. to comment on the process. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. I received a letter from a child in the care of the PLCAS. She is 14 years old and has been in care since she found her mother's dead body in September. This youth is in desperate need of care, counselling and support. Support Peel CAS has not been able to provide. She waited hours for a Peel CAS supervisor who never came to pick her up. Her school social worker has tried to reach out to the CAS but has had no response. Children should be at the centre of all decisions. When will this government start putting vulnerable children first? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I um be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I just want to say uh, to the member opposite that, um, you know, again, I appreciate her, her question. I appreciate her role as the critic to this ministry. Um, but she knows that uh, we have been doing everything we possibly can when it comes to uh, protection of children here in the province of Ontario to make sure that we build a pathway that allows for young people uh, to, to find uh, protected homes and, uh, and guardians and place them back into families. We're changing the way we're doing things uh, when it comes to child protection in the province of Ontario. And uh, we need her, I think we need uh, the member opposite and all members of the legislature here to work with us to, uh, to make sure that children are. are are set up for success in this particular case, and I would uh, I would suggest to the uh, to the, the member opposite if there's a if there's concerns that come forward, uh, individual concerns from people in her community or uh, any community across uh, the province of Ontario. If she talks to me directly, uh, we can make sure that uh, those particular concerns are addressed. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Minister, I hold a monthly seniors advisory group meeting in my riding of Etobicoke Centre, and when I started having those meetings, I started to hear about the issues you would expect. I heard about health care, I heard about transportation, I heard about pocketbook issues, but I also began hearing from seniors who had been the victims or knew someone who'd been the victim of a door-to-door -door sales scam, That's where right. salespeople use coercive, aggressive, or misleading tactics to entice people to sign contracts to take advantage of them right at their very doorsteps, right in their very own home. It is beyond reprehensible to me that some organizations have a business model based on taking advantage of vulnerable people, Shame. and we have to take action to protect Ontarians. Minister, earlier this month, I had the privilege of joining you and the member from Trinity Spadina to announce proposed changes through the uh, Putting Consumers First Act. One of the proposed changes in the legislation is to ban unsolicited door-to-door -door sales of certain home appliances, such as water heaters, furnaces, air conditioners, and water filters. Minister, could you inform the House how these changes will protect vulnerable consumers? Great question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to say thank you to the member from Etobicoke Centre for the question, but particularly his initiative in this long-standing consumer protection issue. 
We have heard Ontarians' concerns regarding door-to-door -door sales and are now acting upon them. The proposed legislation will prohibit unsolicited door-to-door -door sales of some products and services, such as those the member just mentioned. Mr. Speaker, should these rules be violated, the contract would then be void. This means that consumers would no longer have to pay for the product, and if they choose, would be able to keep it as well. It's time we better protect consumers at their front door and in their homes. Mr. Speaker, our government is dedicated to providing people's hard-earned money, which is why we are moving forward answer. with the proposed changes. Good Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for providing those details. And this is really exciting news. I really thank you for your work on this Very important good. issue. You know, thousands of my constituents in Etobicoke Centre have been approached by unscrupulous door-to-door -door salespeople. They dupe them into contracts that are more expensive than industry standards, that have harsh cancellation fees, and that provide inferior products and services that don't work or that don't perform as advertised. I cannot tell you how many seniors I have spoken to who now have to pay money they should have never had to spend for a furnace, an air conditioner, or another product that they never even needed. While this is an issue that cuts across all ages and backgrounds, it's alarming to me to see how often they target seniors or other vulnerable consumers. It's unacceptable. The changes you described will certainly help protect Ontarians from these practices. And Minister, could you provide further detail regarding your plan to protect consumers from aggressive door-to-door -door sales practices? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you again to the member. And I have to say, for his great advocacy on this role, and particularly for our seniors in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, if the proposed legislation is passed, my ministry will further analyze areas of consumer complaints to determine which products and services will be affected by the ban. It also, it's also important to balance consumer protection with fairness to businesses that use good practice and operate with consumer protection law in mind. The proposed legislation will still allow consumer customer initiated contracts. And Mr. Speaker, consumers would be granted a 10-day cooling off period for any contract signed in their own home. This allows people to carefully consider and be confident with any giving purchase. And Mr. Speaker, our goal sure. is to help Ontarians make informed choices in a fair and safe marketplace. No question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, parents of children attending St. Agatha Catholic School got a surprise on the last day of school in June with board notices indicating they were being thrown into another accommodation review process. Surprised because not only did the notice cause speculation as to what happened to the recommendation of the last ARC review for a new school in the area, but even more so because that review only concluded two years ago. Turns out that while parents awaited news on the new school request, the ministry was busy changing the rules of the game, scrapping the once-in-a-five-year period rule to allow accommodation review any time the school board wants to. If at first you don't succeed, just change the rules and try again. <laughs> Will the Premier explain if giving boards the tools to rapidly rid themselves of rural schools was part of the ministry plan Question. all along? Mr. Speaker, you know, I understand that this is a, a challenging issue for communities, which is why, Mr. Speaker, we have continued to increase uh, funding to rural schools, even though uh, most of the boards in the province, Mr. Speaker, have seen declining enrollment. But, Mr. Speaker, again, I say to the member opposite, I understand that that party does not recognize the responsibility of school boards to have local decision-making authority, but we believe that it's important that school boards have the opportunity to work with their communities, Mr. Speaker, to make decisions, for example, around consolidation of schools so that kids can get better programming and better access to, uh, to uh, staff, Mr. Speaker. But those decisions need to be local, and so the process that is in place allows for that consultation. I know it's it's not easy, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a school board trustee, I've watched uh, this, this happen in rural and in urban settings, Mr. Speaker. I know it's a challenge, but thank school you. boards need to have that authority, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Town of Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier is insisting that any closures will be local decisions, but that is only part of the story. Mm. And now, the rest of the story. The province is cutting funding and leaving local officials no options. 
Jim Costello, Lambton Kent District School Board Director of Education, said, and I quote, until the ministry changed the funding formula in April of 2015, we were able to survive. But then he went on to say, and I quote, a lot of that funding has been changed and drastically reduced. So now we have an economic reality that is unavoidable and we have to take action. So, Speaker, to the Premier, why does this government refuse to properly Question. fund rural schools? Here, here, here. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker, and I want to um, thank the members for their, their question. It's important to note that uh, we have increased funding to rural schools, Mr. Speaker, by $3.7 billion, so the funding is not being cut. Mr. Speaker, funding, I want to just mention that funding for Kitchener schools has increased by 79 per cent since 2003, Mr. Speaker, by $551.6 million. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we have built seven new schools. Schools, Baden Public School, Sir Adam Beck Public School, Huron Heights, Williamsburg Public School, J.W. Gerth, Jean Stackel Public School, and John Sweeney Catholic Elementary School. Mr. Speaker, funding for school boards in the Southwest region has increased by $1.2 billion since 2003. That is a 53% increase. That is the rest of the story, Mr. Speaker. The per pupil funding has increased by $4,300. Mr. Speaker, we want to fund kids in class. Classrooms, Thank not you. empty spaces, and that's what we're. Thank you. New question. Member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. My question is for the Minister of Education. Today, residents from Sudbury and Nickel Belt are at Queens Park. They made the long journey down here to protest the consolidation and closure of 12 schools in our area. Speaker, I have seen this movie before, and it does not end well. It ends with four-year-old kids having to be on a bus for three and a half hours a day when the roads are good and longer than this in the winter. It ends with community being gutted and unable to attract young families with kids. It ends with grocery stores and businesses closing. The possible closure of Lavac, Dowling, Chelmsford, and Lively School are the direct result of your funding formula that works in favour of big urban schools at the expense of smaller rural and northern That's schools. True. Minister, will you put a moratorium on any more school closure until the review of your funding Question. formula and the effect it has on northern and rural schools? Minister. Mr. Speaker, We've had um, a review of our, our accommodation review process, and that, that has happened, Mr. Speaker. And, um, and it's important, and it is important that we respect the role of the local trustees, Mr. Speaker. These decisions are not being made at Queen's Park. They are being made by the locally elected school board trustee in consultation with parents, with students, with municipalities, and with their local communities, Mr. Speaker. And we need to allow that process to unfold. And Mr. Speaker, since um, the question regarding the uh, funding for rural schools, it's important to note that since 2012-13, we've increased the annual grants for students' needs funding for rural school boards by over $199 million, and this is despite declining enrollments, Mr. Speaker. So there is more money that is being invested in students in classrooms than in empty classrooms, Mr. Speaker. That is not something that we want to Answer. see sustained. We want that funding to go towards our children's education, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I have gone to see the ministers at least four times about this review. She promised follow-up, but none came. I hand-delivered her a letter from three municipal councillors wanting to meet with her, but no response. I handed her financial analysis showing great discrepancy and still no follow-up. Meanwhile, the kids in my riding in Geneva Lake will have to be on a bus for three and a half hour minimum if Lavac and Dowling School closes. It's hard to imagine how can a four and a five year old learn after they spend so long on the bus. It's hard to leave and come home from school in the dark. It's hard to when you can't participate in school sport and activities because you spend so much time on a bus. Minister, I ask you again, Question. will you put a moratorium on any school closure until the full effect are known for the community and your funding formula is reviewed? Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Speaker, you know, the member opposite knows that, uh, yes, we've had conversations, and I'm engaged with her in, um, in the discussion that is underway and with members of her community. But, Mr. Speaker, these decisions have not been made. These decisions are in a process, Mr. Speaker, and that process requires input, which is exactly what is happening. It would be financially irresponsible, Mr. Speaker, for a school board to do nothing in the face of declining enrollments, and they need to provide those uh, valuable dollars in education for programming for students, Mr. Speaker. So, it's important that municipalities have input, that parents have input, that students have input uh, to these decisions. And that is exactly what is happening through the accommodation review process that is in place, Mr. Speaker. And we have helped school boards to pursue Answer. consolidations by providing $750 million for school consolidation funds so that they can Thank make you. decisions locally, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of International Trade. Our government's decision to turn international trade into a standalone ministry has been well received in the business community, including my riding of Kingston and the Islands. This past week, the minister, along with the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, returned from yet another successful trade mission to India, a growing hub for domestic and financial markets. Collaboration between these two ministries is integral to the agri-food industry as a long-term pillar of our province's economy. I know that the minister has worked tirelessly to bolster the services available to Ontario's companies so that they may be well positioned to enter markets like India and be at an extra advantage. Speaker, could the minister please provide the House with an update on the results of his most recent trip to India and expand upon the growth opportunities available Thank to you. Ontario's businesses? For international trade. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for asking. Speaker, as minister responsible for international trade, I have had the privilege of participating in nine, nine international trade missions so far. However, this mission was the first of its kind focusing on one of Ontario's great strengths, the agri-food industry. I'm proud to say that the demand for Ontario agricultural goods on the international market is at an unprecedented level. Our government, along with our delegates, was successful in the signing of four agreements between eight parties. India is an important market for Ontario, and we look forward to continuing to foster prosperous trade and investment relationship, promote collaboration and encourage future deals. Speaker, first of all, this mission in passive research will serve to encourage more of Ontario's small and medium-sized enterprises to scale up and venture into the world. Thank, Thank you. you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's fantastic to hear of these results, and I know the Minister as well as the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs have worked hard to ensure that our relationship with India remains strong and translates into equitable trade deals. Speaker, our side of the House understands that in order to give our small and medium-sized enterprises a chance to compete on the global stage, we must provide supports. That is why I was so excited to hear the services provide introductions to exporting and in-market support for Ontario businesses that are looking to expand. In an ever-changing global sphere, it is comforting to know that Ontario businesses will be given an opportunity to enter the marketplace informed and prepared. Question. Speaker, could the minister kindly expand on the effects that his ministry services and programs have had on the investments that were made during his trade mission in India? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again for the question. Speaker, our ministry understands that the key to any successful trade mission start with identifying and building market awareness. Speaker, our government's investment in stationing in-market trade development representatives in places like New Delhi have provided a world of contacts and knowledge that plays our province and its businesses at an advantage. It is this on-the-ground approach that allow our government to secure investments from companies like Geo Constat. Geo Constat are a leader in providing solutions for safe 
and sustainable underground construction have seen the potential in our promise and invested in both the Mississauga and Timmins region. But also major companies like PayTM, a company had 150 million clients, a large mobile payment and commerce platform firm. Thank you. They opened PayTM Lab in Toronto. Thank you. Your question, the member from Lampton, Kent, Minnesota. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Premier. Families across my riding of Lampton, Kent, Middlesex are concerned about the future of schools like Bozanquit Central School, North Lampton Secondary School, North Middlesex Secondary School, and many others. Schools like these are the heart of our communities and critical to ensuring a rural way of life can continue. Speaker, rumours are constantly swirling about closures in my riding. It is, an impo it is almost impossible to get reliable information about what schools may be next on the chopping block. Reviews are conducted and reconducted, often with poor community consultation, creating further insecurity and anxiety for families. Speaker, does the Premier think that the students of Lambton Kent Middlesex should have access to public education Question. in their own community, and will she take steps to give certainty to students and families about the future of their schools in Lambton Kent Middlesex? Thank you, education. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And, um, Mr. Speaker, I've heard a lot from parents today, and I know that there are questions that they have, and I'm listening to those, those questions, and I'll, I'll definitely uh, take back what I've heard. And I know that parents are making their way to Queen's Park to voice their concerns about an issue that is close to everyone's heart, and that is the future of their student, and how are we going to provide those necessary supports. And what, what I want to say is that we invest more in rural schools today than we have ever before, Mr. Speaker. That this process in, that we have for the accommodation review enables more student dollars to stay in classrooms where there are students and be upfront with those uh, student programs so that they can have a better experience in their local schools, Mr. Speaker. And every community, Mr. Speaker, is unique. Every community has different needs, and that is why we have the role Answer. of the locally elected school board trustee and uh, and the board to make those decisions on behalf of Thank the you. local schools. Here, here. The member for Northumberland, Quinty West, on a point of order. I'm not sure if it's a point of order, but I'd like to welcome uh, Wendy Giroux from beautiful Port Hope. Wow. Welcome. Wendy. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Gary, on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Just some people that came in late today, the residents from Williamstown, the students from Charline District High School that were in the gallery, but it's since like both, both members are correct. It's not a point of order. <laughs> I beg to inform the House that pursuant to standing order 71C, the chief whip of the third party, the member from Temiskamia Cochrane, has filed with the clerk a reasoned amendment to the motion of second reading of Bill 70, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. The order for second reading of Bill 70 may therefore not be called today. There are no, for, there are no deferred votes, therefore this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.